everybody. It's so good to be worshiping together. Hey, if you'll turn your attention up to the screen this morning, we're all going to confess this together. Let's do that. Meet me, O Christ, in the stillness of morning. Move me, O Spirit, to quiet my heart. Mend me, O Father, from yesterday's harms. From the discords of yesterday, resurrect my peace. From the discouragement of yesterday, resurrect my hope. From the weariness of yesterday, resurrect my strength. From the doubts of yesterday, resurrect my faith. From the wounds of yesterday, resurrect my love. Let me enter this new day aware of my need and awake to your grace, O Lord. Amen. Just pray with me this morning. God, we just come to you in our need this morning. In our felt needs, in our unseen needs, God. You know us better than we know ourselves this morning, Lord. And we realize that something deep inside of us cries out, Abba, Father. And cries out for you, God. Even this morning, just taking a couple of deep breaths and standing here, God. We just recognize our need for you. But yet your presence is with us this morning. Your spirit is with us. It's living and active. So Lord, we put our hope in that this morning. We put our trust in you this morning, Jesus. And we just say, Holy Spirit, come and have your way. Fill us now. And we worship each one of you. God, three in one. In Jesus' name.
do something this morning. Would you all just close your eyes for a second? If you can, just place your hand over your heart this morning. You don't have to sing unless you know the lyrics. Just think about what you're, what I'm going to sing over you here. This bridge, let's make it your prayer this morning. We're going to pray this corporately together as we sing it, okay? Teach my heart. So teach my heart to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Cause Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Teach my song. And teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Cause Jesus, you're my hope and stay sing it all the time, Lord, just as a spontaneous thing that we just acknowledge. Your presence is before us. It's behind us. Every hour, every minute of every day, God. Thank you. Thank you for not leaving us alone. 
Thank you for giving us your spirit. And thank you for giving us one another. Hear this, saints. You're not alone this morning. You may have walked in this room feeling alone. You may be living alone. You may be in a house full of people and still feel alone. But hear this this morning. Jesus is with you. And we are the church. We are, we are t- gathered together and joined together as the body of Christ this morning. So be encouraged and take heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God's so good. Hey, before you grab your seats this morning, man, greet somebody around you. Shake their hand, hug their neck, bless them in the name of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Welcome to Renewal Church, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad you're here today. Um, If you have any questions about who we are, we are a church. This is what we aim to be, a church filled with the Spirit and all kinds of people learning to love one another making Jesus impossible to ignore. We believe that God has planted us in this city to make much of Jesus, to make disciples, people who follow Jesus, who know how to follow Jesus, and who know how to help others learn how to follow Jesus. That's why God put us here. We are put in this city to make much of Jesus, much of him. And so uh, if you're interested in that, you can always reach out to us, renewalmemphis.com. You can shoot us an email, info at Renewal Memphis, if you want to be baptized, if you want to know more, if you want to get connected in one of our communities, uh, our renewal communities, anything. Um, Today we are in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Um, I really couldn't think of something in in terms of like a direct correlation to Father's Day besides, you know, like, you know, spiritual leaders making disciples. So, you know, that you can always fall back on that. But uh, I don't don't have any neat sticky statement or slide to correspond to Father's Day. But uh, I do think we as fathers and all of us as spiritual fathers, men and women, spiritual parents, have something to learn in this text today. We're in a a series in the book of Acts. And so we're going to be in verses, um, let's see, where are we today? Verses 19 through 30. So if you would stand for the reading of God's word, join me in standing for the reading of God's word. Acts uh, chapter 11, verses 19 through 30. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Um, I want to just take a moment and kind of go through some of the themes that we've been learning in the book of Acts. Um, Throughout the book of Acts, there are some themes that have been unfolding to us. And I'm going to tackle a few of them here just for a few moments. Not all of them. There are seemingly countless themes that are beginning to take place. Right now, we're about somewhere between three and five years into the church being founded after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Somewhere in there. And um, so in Acts, we see that um, uh, beginning in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 that uh, Jesus gave a command to his disciples to preach the gospel um, everywhere. And he gave us, he told his disciples where to go. He said, begin in Jerusalem, then go to Judea, which is the surrounding country, then go to Samaria, 
and then go to the uttermost parts of the earth, go to the rest of the world. In fact, I've got a slide that shows you these themes that I'm trying to pull out right now. Um, go to the whole world. Um, also, so that's, that's the outline of the book of Acts. That's the outline of it. This is what, this is what the writer Luke is following as he's going along. Um, faith and baptism go hand in hand. Faith and baptism go hand in hand. You see that a lot. People come to faith in Jesus, and then like, like the first thing that you do is you're immersed in water because that's your way of fully identifying with the life, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We live our lives from the paradigm of the life, death, and burial of Jesus, the gospel. This is how we live our lives. But something else goes hand in hand, favor and persecution. That's tough, favor and persecution. That's tough, to, tough to, uh, to take in. I'm not a fan of that, but it is what it is. Favor and persecution go hand in hand. And yet, when there's persecution, God's people are encouraged and they're strengthened and they're built up and the gospel continues to, to persevere and expand. Um, another theme that we can look at today is that we've learned so far is that ordinary believers are key or a key component in advancing the gospel. Ordinary believers. In fact, we're reading about that this morning in the second part of Acts chapter 11. There wasn't a named evangelist that went to Antioch and were leading people to Jesus. It doesn't say evangelist so-and-so did this or apostle so-and-so. These were ordinary people who went to Antioch and shared the gospel and people came to faith in Christ. And this wasn't an outlier. This is normal in the book of Acts. It's normal. We see the heroes of the book of Acts. Peter, John, and, and Paul, or Saul, who was Paul. In this text, they named Saul of Tarsus. That's the apostle Paul. These are, the, these are the giants that we read about in the book of Acts who oftentimes the shadow of their celebrity obscures the fact that ordinary people are doing the work of Jesus. Ordinary people. Um, that's, that's a symptom of the kingdom of God. That's a symptom of the kingdom of God. Not that the pastors and the preachers are doing it all. But that there is a germ, a kingdom of God germ in the people of God that is compelling them to live for Jesus and share about Jesus. Even that right there is a bit of a, we feel some cultural walls being built. There is a growing um, animus against evangelistic work in our culture. It's considered um, proselytizing, and that's used as as an insult, as, as something that we shouldn't do. That, that, that's, it's, that's not right that we should interfere in someone else's life and call them to repentance. And so Jesus was right. He said that a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. And there are things that we will never, ever, ever, ever be able to compromise. That the world won't be excited about. People probably aren't going to celebrate the fact that we are sharing the gospel and calling people to surrender to the lordship of Jesus, who was king of all kings. He was king of the universe. But this is what we're called to do. This is what we're called to do. Um, there's a priority that is put on strengthening believers. And by strengthening, I would like to use the term training. In our culture, strengthening could mean something like, I'm encouraged and feel stimulated about the faith. It's more than, simple, uh, than a simple emotional lift regarding the way we feel about Jesus. When the scriptures talk about training disciples or strengthening the disciples, it is grounding them in God's word so that they can be a faithful witness as a faithful community in the community that God has planted them. So, and it's, and it's, it's communal as well. It's not just individual, it's communal. When the believers are being strengthened, they're not being strengthened in the sense that I know Jesus better and you know Jesus better, although that would be true. But the priority is that we are woven together. We are fitted together. We are meshed together. Us who practice the faith in the local church, we're meshed together in such a way that it's not just individually that we're growing in Jesus, but corporately as the body of Christ. The way that we love one another and serve one another is a signpost to the kingdom of God. 
that our community should, should be pointing to the ways of the kingdom of God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These should be the virtues of our community that we reach for. But it's not automatic. We're going to talk about this in a second. It's not just automatic because you come to faith in Jesus. All this stuff should happen. Barnabas arrived in Antioch and saw the grace of God at work and said, you know what? The grace of God is at work. And he didn't walk away and think that's enough. He said, we need to train these people. So where grace is working, there needs to be training. That's one of the themes as well that we see. Strengthening the believers. There's another one. New possibilities because of grace. New possibilities because of grace. From Acts, all through the book of Acts so far, there's been this tension that's been building. What about people who are non-Jews? Do they have to become circumcised and follow the law like us Jews who've embraced Jesus in order to be saved? And it was settled in the last chapter. And we're pointing to the hinge point in Acts, which is Acts chapter 15, where the apostles finally figure this out, that people who are not Jews who embrace Jesus do not have to embrace circumcision. They, are, they enter into the community of saints because of grace. And here's the thing, so do Jews who believe. Jews and Gentiles enter into God's family because of grace, grace. And so explicitly, we're seeing a tearing down of the wall between Jew and Gentile. But generally, we're also seeing God's promise to Abraham begin to get some, uh, to get some momentum. God made a promise to Abraham that his offspring, the Jews, the Israelites, they would be the offspring, the ethnic group that God would use to bring his gospel to the rest of the world so that every ethnic group would come to faith in Jesus and be a part of God's family. You know what God's dream is? It's a multi-ethnic family who adores and loves him and who adores and loves one another. And Satan and the power of hell fights every day against this. Every day. This is what God is doing. Even the church has fallen prey for some of Satan's tricks and traps in this regard. It's pathetic and it's sad. And it's something that we should be very, very aware of. That the priority that God has put on his kingdom in this world is a reunion, a holy, multi-ethnic reunion in Jesus. A holy, multi-ethnic reunion in Jesus. And then there's another thing. The spirits, and it's related to the last one I just mentioned. The spirits' relentless push of believers beyond their comfort zones. Constantly pushing, constantly pushing. He is never going to let up. Your assumptions are never going to heal from their bruises. The Holy Spirit is going to pound them for the rest of your life. You will, your assumptions, the things that you really, 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 really want to believe that can't stand up to the scrutiny of Scripture, they are always going to be beat up and cut up and, and jumped by God because he will not let us live in the safety of our assumptions and our preconceived ideas. He is going to push us beyond what we want, what we believe, what we think, into the adventure and the frightening, uh, the, the frightening adventure of what his kingdom is. This is what he does. You see this all throughout the book of Acts. Even in this text, we are seeing God continue to push, push on the assumptions and the beliefs of guys like Barnabas and others. And so these are the themes that we see throughout the book of Acts. This is where we're going. This is where we've been. And so what happens is that the gospel goes to a place called Antioch. Antioch is about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. Antioch is generally a pagan city, a pagan city. Um, there's a lot of Jews there, but Antioch is a metropolitan city. It's a big city. And interestingly, Antioch begins to sort of take the place of Jerusalem as the base of ministry through the rest of the book of Acts. 
the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys that we read about from Acts 13 and on through the end of the book of Acts launch from the church at Antioch. So there's, a dis- so there's a moving, a-, a changing. We're even seeing that in our world. You know, for the longest time, it seemed like the Western world, particularly America, sent the most missionaries all over the world to bring the gospel. And now, uh, people a lot smarter than me who study this stuff are saying that now the biggest sending countries of missionaries are not countries in the West, where revival is most fertile, where revival is most on fire in the world is in Asia, and it's in South America. America and other parts of the world. There seems to always be this moving center of what God is doing in the world. We can either dislike it or hate it, be against it, or we can get on board with it and thank God and praise him for what he's doing. Um, these people, there are people who went to, we don't know these people, which is interesting. There are people who went to Antioch to escape the persecution that the church was facing in Jerusalem. They went to Antioch. It's not bad to run from persecution. <laughs> you, see the, you see that all through the book of Acts. People get beat up, they get ridiculed, and they, they have to move on. They have to move on. Um, sometimes they stay. Sometimes the, a guy like the Apostle Paul is taken outside of a city and stoned and beaten, and then he goes back in. And other times they run. They wipe, shake the dust from their feet, and they leave. Um, It's an adventure. But these people ran from persecution. They left persecution in Jerusalem. And they go to Antioch. And ordinary people begin sharing the gospel. Ordinary people begin telling people about Jesus. Assumedly, they went to the synagogues there and began to minister to people. And, but they also shared the gospel with other people. It says that they reached out to the Hellenists. Now, if you remember, back in Acts chapter 6, we also read about Hellenists. And in the Greek, that word Hellenist back in Acts chapter 6 refers to um, Jewish Christians who spoke Greek. In this, the Greek word is slightly different, and it refers to pagan Gentiles. And so there were many, many, many Gentiles who were coming to faith in Jesus. Now, let's think for a second. You guys nerd out with me just for a second. Remember what we talked about last week? Anybody remember a guy that we read about last week? It was that good, huh? Uh, anybody remember? Cornelius. Cornelius. Who was Cornelius? Anybody remember? Who did he work for? For the, Romans, for the Roman military. That's who he worked for. Um, he lived in a place called Caesarea. It was on the, on the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, he had a lot of responsibilities. Um, but the thing about Cornelius is that he wasn't a Christian. He was a Gentile. He wasn't Jewish. He was a Gentile. And the gospel came to his family, begrudgingly in a sense. God had to give Peter a vision to go to this man named Cornelius' house. Peter went. He would not, he would not have gone had the Holy Spirit not led him. He goes to his house, and as he is preaching, the Spirit of God falls on his whole household. It was remarkable what happened. Theologians call this the Gentile Pentecost. The Gentile Pentecost. And so the Spirit of God fell on those people. And now what we're seeing in in the rest of Acts chapter 11 is some believers, they're putting two and two together, and they realize this isn't just for Jews This is for people outside the Jewish family. This is for all nations. And so when they go to Antioch, they preach the gospel. They proclaim the gospel. They share the gospel with people who are not Jewish. And these people come to faith in Jesus. And so in this thriving metropolitan city, there is a church that is emerging there. That was an organic church. Didn't have institutional authority. They didn't have a building. They didn't own property. It was a church that just emerged organically through the life and the evangelistic witness of believers, these ordinary people. Again, there's no evangelist that's named or apostle that came and, and, and plowed the ground, who blazed a trail. They went there and they lived for Jesus. Which It's interesting because Barnabas was sent by the church at Jerusalem 
to investigate these believers. Do they believe the right stuff? Has the Holy Spirit really come upon them? Is this a legitimate body of believers as far as you can tell? And the answer was yes. And then they needed training. So can you imagine the beautiful chaos of this church? Ministering the gospel, not having a lot of theological development, not like us, many of us in this room have grown up going to Sunday school. I mean, some of the simplest things we believe about Jesus we've heard in, in, Christian, in, in, a, uh, in, in children's curriculum. These people had none of that to lean on. None of that. This bunch of people who don't know Jesus come to faith in Jesus, and they were led to faith in Jesus by a bunch of ordinary nameless, faceless people that history has forgotten about that angels rejoice over. And that lets us know something, that in a world like the one we live in, God has called us to share the gospel, and it's okay if you're dumb. It's okay if you don't know how to debate the Jehovah's Witness who comes to your door. It's okay. No pressure. It's okay if you've got really, really, really brilliant friends who are far more red than you and may even feel like they know more about the faith than you do, and yet they're skeptical and you're a believer. At the end of the day, the power of God is not dependent on our intellectual abilities. What is ground zero of the power of God? Anybody know? Something that connects with your heart, though. The gospel. The gospel is the power of God leading to salvation. Not your intellectual brilliance. Not your ability to win a debate. In fact, there have been many people who won debates that were later humbled by the Holy Spirit and the gospel. So there is no pressure on us to be super smart to read a ton of books before we can go share the gospel. We just faithfully share the gospel and bear testimony of what God has done in our lives and what God wants to do in other people's lives. And if they laugh at us and make fun of us and call us idiots, it's okay they did the same thing to Jesus. It's okay. I'm not trying to demonize non-believers. Please understand, I'm, not, I'm really not. I'm not, I'm not. If it wasn't for God's grace, I would be skeptical and, and, and an unbeliever myself. My point is, is that we are not called to overcome people, to compel people, to colonize people. We are called to simply love people and share the gospel with them. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus and what he desires to do in their lives and reconciling them to God. All we have to do is share our story. And if that's rejected, it's okay. It's not your responsibility to make people Christians. It's not. And if you can remember that, then it takes so much pressure off. It takes so much pressure off. Well, I don't want people to think bad of me. There are a ton of people in your life who already think bad of you. Everybody is, everybody is toxic these days. Everybody has somebody in their life that thinks bad of them. Everybody does. My goodness, me more than any of y'all. Ask any of our former members at any other church around this city. They've got something to say about me. You know, it's just, it's just something you got to get over. It's something you got to get over. People are going to think bad stuff about you. We don't have to be that toxically codependent. We can let it go. Just let it go. They're going to think bad stuff about us. As my, grandf my, my grandfather, <laughs> feels like my grandfather, my father-in-law says, um, you, can't, you shouldn't rent space in other people's heads. Stop doing that. So I love what 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 says. It says this. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. Hmm. What does he mean by that? I could not address you as spiritual people. Last week I mentioned how toxic and messed up the Corinthian church was. And yet Paul said that they were cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Even though they were knuckleheads, Paul said, you have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus because of grace, not because of your works. And so he says, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. So by spiritual people, he means developed, discipled, maturing people in Jesus. Why couldn't he speak to them as mature people, but he had to do baby talk? Come here, baby, 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 baby. Take the bite. 
take the bite. There you go. Why did he have to talk to them like that? Why do you have to do that with it? They were infants in Christ. What made them infants in Christ? I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for. I mean, this, he's, he's, they're babies in Christ. Why? What's going on? And even now you are not ready. You're not ready for the substance I want to give you. For you are still of the flesh. What does he mean? Are they like sex addicts? Do they steal stuff? What are they doing that's really, really, really bad that shows that they're infants in Christ? For while there is jealousy and strife among you, jealousy and strife, aren't those like the lower sins? I mean, aren't those like the culturally accepted, like jealousy? It just, it happens, you know, it happens. Where there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? In other words, you are not behaving in a way that reflects your baptism, that you are of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You're behaving in a human way. He didn't say they don't know enough theology. That's not what makes them babies in Christ. He's not talking about their belief system, how they've been trained in the gospel. He's not talking about any of that stuff. He's talking about the way that they behave. You are jealous of each other and their strife. And that shows you little babies. You cute little babies. Come here. Let me sit you in my lap. Let's read some Bible stories together. That's how I did with you, Maya, when you were 20 years ago. Um, For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not merely, uh, behaving merely, are you not being merely human? So these were people that were like, you know what, Paul, I'm, he's not for me. I'm of Apollos. He's a, like, that guy can talk. He is an orator. And others are like, you know what, Paul is a, man, Paul trained her to Gamaliel. This dude is a legit scholar. He's a good preacher, but Paul's a scholar. I'm of him. I, it, sadly, there's, there's no analogy that I can think of in the church today where people behave that way. So maybe you can find a way to apply, apply, your, apply that to your own life. Um, who, what then is Apollos? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? What are they? Servants through whom you believed. That's it. As the Lord assigned to each. So here's what Paul says. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. I planted, Apollos watered, but You're not where you are because of us. God brings the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. So a wrong wrong application of this would be I don't need to sit under teaching them. That's not, that can't be true. Because Paul's teaching them by writing him this letter, writing them this letter. Paul said, I planted I didn't waste my time. Paul didn't waste his time. We have to believe that. What he's saying is this, that yes, we do important things as ministers of the gospel, but at the end of the day, your growth results only from the Holy Spirit. God uses us, but don't look at us as the source of your strength and your relationship with Jesus. This can be really liberating for us. It's been liberating for me. As a pastor, preaching the gospel, there have been times I've seen fruit and there have been swaths of time in my ministry where, man, I'll be honest with you, I've lamented and been sad that I've not seen fruit that I wanted to see. But at the end of the day, it's God who brings the increase. All I can do is plant or water. And the same thing is true with us, guys. As followers of Jesus, all we can do is plant and water. We can share our story. We can share the gospel. At the end of the day, God brings the increase. You don't have to be brilliant. You don't have to be a theologian. Just be faithful. And so many believed. Many believed. And of of those who believed, there were pagan people. This is the most notable place up to this point in the story that we're reading. Where a church has had a huge impact and huge fruitfulness with people who don't believe who who weren't Jewish. 
tons of people. And so they send this guy named Barnabas. They send this guy named Barnabas. Barnabas is a close friend of Paul's, who's still called Saul at this point. And they send Barnabas to investigate. And what I love about Barnabas is what Luke says about him. Luke says that Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. He's a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And Barnabas goes to this church that doesn't look like anything he's ever experienced. It's made up of a bunch of people who don't share his assumptions on things. Barnabas goes to this church, and I'm sure he felt awkward at this church. He didn't feel like, maybe he didn't feel like he fit in very well. This wasn't a group of Jewish believers who had come to Christ, and they shared the same stories in their upbringing. They shared the same practices and cultural habits and cultural assumptions. This was a church that was totally different than anything Barnabas had ever seen. And Luke makes sure that we know he was a good man and filled with the Holy Spirit. And Barnabas looked at this community and he judged it as the grace of God has saturated these people. I can't argue with it. The grace of God is here. It took humility for Barnabas to make that assessment. We see in other books of the Bible, Galatians, and even through the book of Acts, how there were people in the Jerusalem church who were still really, really struggling with the idea of pagan people coming to faith in Jesus and being given entry into the church. They struggled with that. And for Barnabas to one day go back home to Jerusalem and say, guys, the grace of God is upon these Gentile believers who were formerly pagan. There would have been people who would not have been excited about that. I felt the same way today. This, you could interpret this as political, and this is why I'm giving this qualification. I had the same reservation in my heart today because of what I wanted to do was come and say, happy June, Juneteenth to all of my African-American brothers and sisters. I think that is a beautiful, beautiful day to be honored. The liberation of African slaves in our country. That should not be a footnote in history. And I know, saying stuff like that, I hear all the voices in my head. A Democrat is the one who signed that into being. And so Chris is once again showing his liberal streak by trying to shove liberal propaganda down our throats. You may think that, and you have every right to think that if you want. That's a pretty cynical point of view. I will say that I love and care very deeply that the story of our African-American brothers and sisters is honored and acknowledged in our society because largely it has been dishonored and not properly acknowledged. And I thank God that I lead a multiracial church. And in Memphis, usually what that means is black and white. <laughs> my family lives in Toronto. My, my wife's family and multiracial is not just, you know, a binary. It's so much more than that. And I know that there are others amongst our congregation who are Hispanic and from other ethnic backgrounds with respect to you. But I'm thankful for this. So I'm, every year we're going to thank God for Juneteenth. And I don't care if a Republican, a Democrat, or an alien signed that into being. I don't care. I think we should acknowledge and honor this day. I think we should. It's a small thing. I know I'm not fixing racial, racial problems in our country by saying this. I know that. I know that. I'm not naive. But I do want to say this. And I also want to acknowledge that this is not in the text this morning. But I get it. An application for me is I get the cultural pressure, the... the um, the lens that we have been trained to see our whole world through, liberal, conservative. Gospel and scripture is down here somewhere. Everything we, we are being trained by everything we're exposed to in the media to look at everything as being a binary, liberal or conservative. And I reject that. I reject that. 
I feel the same pressure that Barnabas might have felt having to go back to Jerusalem and say, guys, God is at work in these people, knowing that some people would not have been happy to hear that. And I know some of you, me saying happy Juneteenth to our black brothers and sisters, I know that's hard to hear. I know that's hard to hear. I love you. And if that's hard to hear, I challenge you to ask yourself why. Why? Why? Why does everything have to be connected to that binary of liberal conservative? Why can't we tell the truth about ourselves? The good, the bad, and the ugly. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The church, I think, if we're going to make a real impact, having a hope of making a real impact in the future, we are going to have to repent of our political paradigms and fully embrace the kingdom of God paradigm. And we are going to have to be a people who is intellectually honest. And regardless of who is in office and who is not in office, we need to be able to speak the truth about what is evil and what is good, what is righteous and what is unrighteous. I am not the first to say and point out the hypocrisy of how loud conservatives were in the late 90s when Bill Clinton was president and how quiet it has been since then. If we have any hope of reaching this world, this Western world that is rapidly deconstructing and rejecting Jesus, we have to look at ourselves and be intellectually honest and call what is right, right, and what is wrong, wrong, regardless of the political ramifications. We have to. We have to. We have to. Well, that was off script. So let's get back on and I'll wrap this up today. And I, and I want to be clear. I say that not to control how you vote. That's between you and God. I am talking about the reputation of Jesus. And the reputation of Jesus is tied to his people in this world. And we had better be honest with ourselves and repent of our sins and call what is right, right, and what is wrong, wrong, or an unbelieving world is going to continue to look at us as fools and hypocrites, and rightly so. Rightly so. And so what did Barnabas do? Barnabas saw that grace was at work in this church. And what did he do? These people need training. Just because grace is at work doesn't mean that's it. If you are sitting in this room and you're thinking to yourself, I have come to faith in Jesus, but man, I don't know so much. I've not seen growth in my life. I am struggling with where I am in God. That's not a bad thing. It might be diagnosing a weakness in our church in helping you to become a disciple. You might be diagnosing that. That's something that several of us are thinking through right now. How can we, with the people who are eager to serve Jesus, how can we create environments where transformational growth can take place and people are trained in Jesus? I'm going to ask you to please pray for us. We are in the final stages of negotiations with a space that we are looking to lease on Summer Avenue. I'm not going to tell you where yet. It's very close by to where we are now. Um, this is not done, and this may not happen. Um, but this space is close enough to where we are now that it's not a, a much, much of a longer drive for any of our members. It's a space that we have tried to walk away from over and over and over again. It's like a tape stuck to your piece of tape stuck to your finger. We can't get rid of it. Um, but it appears that maybe Jesus is leading our church to this space. It would give us the opportunity to do things such as plant a Hispanic church in that same facility one day. And we're already in the process of planning this. It would give us the opportunity to do work amongst the poor. Agabus, 
this prophet came up to Antioch to give a warning to the church there that there was going to be a great famine. Did you know that it was this prophecy and that famine that framed the apostle Paul's ministry? So that when he went into the world and preached the gospel and made disciples amongst Gentile, non-believing people, he would then collect money from them and bring it back to the church at Jerusalem to provide and care for that church. When he was appointed an apostle, they specifically told him, do not forget the poor. Don't forget them. And he said, I won't. And so we're in the final stages of negotiations. We see this as a, as a potential Antioch move for us. Not that this building is going to change us, but it is the opportunity for us to change. I'm not naive. A location change won't change us, at least in, in, in terms of making us better. We're going to have to change. But this is a place that we will be able to launch wonderful, fr- hopefully by God's grace, fruitful ministry from. Minister to the poor, and do really, really good works that brings fame to Jesus. It is not a done deal. We're in the final stages of negotiation. We need you to pray. And if the negotiations go south, we're going to take that as the word of the Lord. He's shutting this door. I am not emotionally attached to it. I didn't want to go to it for the longest time. It's not like it's in a crazy part of town where people are going to get, you know, get robbed all the time or something like that. It's not, it's not like that. But it's not affluent Poplar Perkins where we're surrounded by people who, with respect to them, really, really, really have a struggle being aware of their need for Jesus. This could be incredible for us, but it may not be God's will. We need God's knowledge. We need God to speak. And so if the door remains open, it's possible that we could be signing a lease within the next couple of weeks. And when we do that, we are trying to plan a Sunday in July where we can all gather at this space and just look at it because there's a lot of work that's got to be done. Um, so keep your ears open. But right now, all I'm asking, don't, don't send me an email, ask me where it is, okay? Just, just, just pray. Just pray. Um, please, would, you, would you please pray that the Lord would either open or shut this door? I am totally cool with whatever God does. I'm not emotionally attached to it. It's all good. If God wants us there, praise God, we will go. Um, Okay, last thing I want to say is this. This is the first place that Christians were called Christians. This is the first place Christians were called Christians. Christ is the Greek parallel for the word Messiah, the anointed king. These people who came to faith in Christ were known as the people of the anointed king Jesus. That's how they were known. They were not a perfect church, to be sure. But that's how they were known. They are people of the anointed King Jesus. Yeah. Please, come on up. As you pray for us, for where we're going to be, I I would like to remind you of the journey that we've been on. Mm -hmm. This started many years ago in a bean field in Fayette County, a little brick church building across from an aromatic chemical plant. It was really interesting. Uh, I remember the first Sunday, Valerie and I walked into that building and stood before that congregation, and we worshiped with them. We got in our car, and we were driving out of the parking lot, and I stopped, and we looked at each other, and all we could say, we said simultaneously, what was that? <laughs> because it was so different from what we had known. It was, I think that's a part of our journey though. We started in a very humble place. But because we did, God so blessed us there. And we were able to bless so many people. But that wasn't the end of the journey either. From there, we ended up in a VFW club. For the uninitiated, that's a Veterans of Foreign Wars bar. 
in Collierville, Tennessee, where you had to bring in the chairs and set them up and tear them down and all the rest every Sunday. Again, it was very, very humble beginnings, reaching a community of people that tended to be on the poor side of the economy. They were not poor in spirit, but they knew what it was to lack. That's how God has led us. From there, we ended up in a rented facility at the uh, what used to be called the Germantown Community Center. Not that big, nice one. This was a little one on the other side of the tracks. It somehow seems like we've always been on the other side of the tracks somehow. And, uh, you know, from there, we, we ended up on Houston Levee. We, Val and I were in a church recently on Houston Levy, just right down from that location where we were. And we met many people in that church that back 30 years ago were a part of what we called Christ the Rock at that time. God blessed us in every one of these locations. It did not matter how humble it was, what the surrounding community and neighborhoods looked like. No, God was with us. He's going to be with us as long as we are true to him. As long as we will be honest about God's calling on our lives. We've known big buildings out there on Winchester. We've known what it was to go back into a lease facility in a school over there on Quince. We've known what it's been like to be here. We've always been, I think that by definition is an apostolic type of church. It's on the move. We're on a journey together. And I just wanted to encourage you, don't be afraid. God has been with us all these years. He's not going to forsake us now. I believe he's going to reposition us for even greater fruitfulness to reach this city, all the people of this city. This church has always been like this. Regardless of ethnicity, regardless of uh, uh, denominational background, regardless of what neighborhood or community we are, have been in, he's always with us. He never leaves us and he never forsakes us. And we can always always come together and break bread even as we come to the Lord's table this morning the Lord's table is with us it's not in just a building that we may have left it's with us and Father I just thank you this morning for this bread and all that it speaks to us it speaks to us that you broke your body. You poured yourself out. And you brought us into your everlasting life. Lord, we want so much to give this bread that you have so generously fed us with to another generation to another people that we are uniquely anointed to reach for the spirit of the Lord is upon us and he has anointed us to preach good news to the poor to proclaim healing to the brokenhearted, deliverance to those who are oppressed to open the eyes of the blind to proclaim liberty to the captives, to declare that this is the year of the favor of the Lord. Lord, we take this bread. We take it, Lord, gratefully. We take it, Lord, because we're all a part of your body. And we receive it gladly. In the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord. Mm. We thank you, Lord, for the cup of the new covenant. 
Pastor Chris, I just loved what you were talking about there, about the things that go hand in hand together. I was thinking about how grace and truth go hand in hand together. Husbands and wives go hand in hand together. So much that goes hand in hand together. And we're going hand in hand together into the future and the hope that God has for Renewal Church. Lord, we thank you for this new covenant. Thank you, Lord, that Jews and Gentiles go hand in hand together into your kingdom. Thank you for it, Lord. A better covenant built on better promises for all the promises of God are yes and amen. In Jesus' name, we receive this now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As you're kind of gathering your things together, I wonder if you'd just be willing to stand up with me. Father, I thank you this day for a powerful word that's been spoken over us. I thank you this day, Lord, for your generous spirit toward us. I thank you this day for the unity that only comes through the power of your Holy Spirit to bring a diverse group of people like us together so that we can be a witness and a testimony in this city so that others, oh Lord God, can see that there are those who love you, Lord, who love one another and who are walking hand in hand into your perfect will for our lives. And for that, we give you all the glory and honor and praise in Jesus mighty name amen God bless you friends have a wonderful Father's Day dad glory in your family today amen <laughs>